Let us bow our heads. Father, we want to thank you for giving us another day. Thank you for life, health, and strength. God, thank you for the love, kindness, compassion, mercy, and grace that you have bestowed upon us, and you continue to do so each and every day. God, you are worthy of the glory and the honor, and I just want to take this time to acknowledge your greatness. I want to thank you, Heavenly Father, for birthing this great and prestigious institution, Morgan State University. God has assembled us today as we come together to acknowledge, to inform, and to celebrate the many contributions that were made and are being made by women in today's society. I ask you, Lord, to give us an attentive ear and an open heart, and that you ignite within us the determination and the strength that we need to courageously face and triumph over every obstacle in our lives. God, I ask you to empower us today, to uplift us, and to remind us that as we transcend, as we rise above and go beyond the limits that have been placed upon us as women and as African-American women, that not only will our lives be changed, but we will successfully impact the generations to come. Thank you for Morgan State University and this opportunity to learn, grow, and to be inspired. It is in your holy name I pray, amen. Amen. Thank you, you may be seated. At this time, we will have the occasion by Ms. Tenyo Pearl, who represents as Ms. Morgan, 1989-1990. Following her, we will have a musical selection by Ms. Danielle Muse. Greetings, fellow Morganites. Greetings. Yes, it's a pleasure to be here on this joyous occasion. As it was said, I am Tenyo Pearl, and I had the pleasure of serving as Miss Morgan State, 1989-90. It's truly an honor and a privilege to have an opportunity to return to my alma mater and be a part of Morgan's Sesquicentennial Women's History Month celebration. The theme for this special occasion is Transcending Generations, Morgan Women at 150 is not without merit as Morgan Women have and continue to operate as positive change agents in our world. The celebration of women's history in this country can be traced back to the 1911 observance of International Women's Day. More than a half a century later, in 1978, the Education Task Force of the Sonoma County, California Commission on the Status of Women initiated a Women's History Week celebration. Just two years later, on February 28, 1980, President Jimmy Carter issued the following statement establishing the week of March 8th as National Women's History Week. From the settlers who came before the, before, for the, for the settlers who came to our shores, from the first American Indian families who befriended them, men and women worked together to build this nation. Too often, the women were unsung, and sometimes their contributions were not noticed. But the achievements, leadership, courage, strength, and love of the women who built America was as vital as of that to the men whose names we all know so well. In 1987, after years of individual state efforts, Congress declared March as Women History Month. Here, we, here at Morgan, we are especially sensitive to not only the achievements of women, but as an HBCU, we take great pride in illuminating the achievements of women of color. While all women must have braved the challenges presented by sexism, women of color must also endeavor and triumph over racism. Your presence here this morning really means a lot. 
Thank you for joining us for Morgan State University's Sesquicentennial Women's History Month Convocation. If you look in the back of your program booklet, you will see that we're celebrating women's history throughout the entire month of March. And we invite you to attend every program that your schedule permits. In closing, I would like to share with you my favorite African proverb. If we stand strong, it is because we stand on the shoulders of those who came before us. Morgan State University has a rich legacy of sheroes dating back to Ms. Susie Carr Love, the first female graduate of the Centenary Biblical Institute in 1878, the predecessor to Morgan College. Throughout history, Morgan women, such as our mayor of Baltimore City, Catherine Pugh, Verda Freeman Welcome, Rochelle Stevens, Mesa Leak, Ann Colger, April Ryan, Victorine Adams, Doreen Spencer, Shana Powell, and many others continue to march forward while serving as strong leaders and powerful change agents. So without further ado, I'd like to say thank you again for being here this morning, and we hope that you enjoyed the program. Just beautiful. Our next person coming to introduce our speaker was not born when I was here over 25 odd some years ago. <laughs> I am happy to introduce our Miss Morgan 2016-17, Miss Kayla Lawrence. Good morning, everyone. 
Again, my name is Kayla Nate Lawrence, and I have the pleasure of serving as Miss Morgan State University for the 2016-2017 academic school year. And I also have the honor of introducing our guest speaker for today. A native of Burlington, North Carolina, Dr. Toya Corbett is the Dean of Students at North Carolina Central University. She is responsible for promoting and upholding the values of civility, personal integrity, and academic ex excellence by providing resources, advocacy, and crisis management for all students. Dr. Corbett also provides executive le level leadership for the Office of Diversity and Inclusion, the Women's Center, the Men's Achievement Center, Student Responsibilities and Community Standards, Spiritual Development and Dialogue, Student Affairs Assessment, and Staff Training. Prior roles include serving as the Executive Director of Student Engagement and Leadership at North Carolina Central University, Coordinator for the Office of Student Activities at Morgan State University, and five years in the Corporate Office of Wachovia, now Wells Fargo, in Charlotte, North Carolina. While at Morgan State University, she was named one of the top 50 women under 40 in Maryland. Additionally, Dr. Corbett founded a program called The Leading Ladies, Leadership Development and Personal Growth Series, a four-pronged program designed to assist, cultivate, and encourage academic, career, academic and career success, leadership skills, self-awareness, financial fitness, and team building among the female students, faculty, and staff population at Morgan State University. As a trained historian, scholar, and student affairs professional, Dr. Corbett has spoken at numerous conferences, workshops, and seminars. Additionally, she has curated historical exhibits and published a book titled, The Morgan State University Woman, The First 60 Years, 1934 to 1994. Dr. Corbett is also an entrepreneur who conducts dining etiquette training as The Etiquette Doctor, and she owns a t-shirt company called Black Genius Apparel. Black Genius Apparel's mission is to eradicate discriminatory and mythical philosophies concerning African Americans' mental aptitude, while empowering, inspiring, and affirming blackness, black thought, the black intelligent Illigentensia, black pride, and the fortitude of a black genius. She is a member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, where she has served on the international board of directors and several national committees. Dr. Corbett earned a bachelor's degree in psychology from the University of North Carolina at Charlotte, a master's of arts in African American studies, and a doctorate in history, both from Morgan State University. So please stand and give a warm welcome to, Ms. to Dr. Toya Corbett. Good morning, Morgan State University. Good morning. Good morning to Dr. Wilson, uh, members of the Board of Regents, uh, Dr. Gibson, Dr. Welch, uh, Miss Morgan State University, Dr. Bernie Hollis, my good friend, Dr. Edwin Johnson. I am completely honored and humbled to stand on this sacred stage, not only in honor of Women's History Month, but also in celebration of the 150-year journey of one of the greatest universities in the country, the place that I love, Morgan State University. Yesterday, yes. <laughs> Yesterday, the world celebrated International Women's Day. It was a day that women were to not engage in any paid or unpaid work. Women were to wear red in solidarity, and women were not supposed to spend any money. The end goal was to experience a day without women. Because without women, now, I believe the world would actually stop spinning. For instance, children would not get dressed or fed for school. The dry cleaners and laundry mat would be closed. Memos would not be written and typed. Hotels would be filthy without maid service. Hospitals would shut down without enough nurses or physicians. Restaurants would be unable to serve as patrons without waitresses. 
Whole school systems were closed like what happened at Prince George's County Public School System on yesterday. You would be unable to check a book out of the library. The WNBA would cease to exist. Who would make the biscuits at McDonald's? <laughs> or better yet, grandma's house. And black women, black women would lose their minds because hair salons would be closed. <laughs> now imagine, if you will, Morgan State University without women. Where would we be? History tells us that the first students who attended Centenary Biblical Institute back in 1867 were nine men who were prospective ministers. Nine men. It would be seven years before the first class of females were admitted in 1874. In that class was a woman named Susie H. Carr who in 1878 becomes the first female graduate of Centenary Biblical Institute. Now, Ms. Carr was from Lynchburg, Virginia. She was described as headstrong and determined. She married a man named Julius Love. They met while both were attending Centenary Biblical Institute. Julius went on to receive a diploma from Howard University's Theological School in 1900. He was a well-known and respected minister, but due to her high level of intellect, Susie Carr had just as many speaking engagements as her husband. Two of the Carr's children, Edgar and Julius, attended what was then known as Morgan Academy. Edgar eventually became Bishop Edgar A. Love and was a founder of Omega Psi Phi Fraternity Incorporated. The chapel inside Morgan State University Memorial Chapel is named for Susie Carr Love. Ironically, in 1867, the year Morgan was founded, a black woman named Ida Rebecca Cummins was born in the city of Baltimore. Her parents were both entrepreneurs. Her father owned a catering business and her mother ran a boarding house at their home. This was very important and much needed during the age of racial segregation in Baltimore. Ida grew up and attended college first at Hampton Institute, but she came here and finished her degree at Morgan College in 1922. Thereafter, Ida became a school teacher and eventually became the first black kindergarten teacher appointed in Maryland. For 18 years, Ida Cummins served as president of the Colored Fresh Air and Empty Stocking Circle. It was a women's organization organized by by providing Christmas stockings to children who otherwise would not receive any gifts. The organization also fostered healthy environments by paying for boarding for them in rural homes during the summer. From 1912 to 1914, Ida Cummins was secretary of the National Association of Colored Women and chair of the planning committee for its annual convention. She was a trustee of Bennett College for Women and served as president of the Republican Women's League. In 1939, Ms. Cummins became the first woman on the board of trustees of Morgan State College. Her mother was Eliza Cummins, from whom Cummins Hall on this campus was named. Mrs. Eliza Cummins was a great civic and church leader who voluntarily raised more money than any other person for the erection of a building which Morgan College occupied at the corner of Edmonds and Fulton Avenues in Baltimore City. By the way, Ida's brother, Harry S. Cummins, was the first black elected to the Baltimore City Council. If there were no women at Morgan, we would barely have a library. There was a woman named Beulah Myrtle Davis, a 1925 graduate of Morgan College. Ms. Davis worked as the campus librarian from 1926 to 1965. Those of you who have visited the Beulah Davis Special Collections Department in the Earl S. Richardson Library, that is why it is named in her honor. Now, did you know in 1886, Morgan established Princess Anne Academy, now known as the University of Maryland Eastern Shore? Now, there was a woman there born in 1876 named Helen Roberts. She attended Princess Anne Academy and became the foster daughter of Dr. O'Connell, who was the principal of the academy and for whom on this campus O'Connell Hall is named. 
Mom Roberts, as she was affectionately called, joined the Morgan College staff in 1929 and served for 42 years. She started as dean of women and then transferred to food service. She catered to the athletic team, and when Martin Jenkins was president, she would prepare dinner for the Board of Regents every night of their meetings. The Helen Roberts faculty and staff dining room is named in her honor. Did you know in 1893, Morgan students that Morgan established Virginia Collegiate and Industrial Institute, now Virginia State University? In December 1917, a major fire erupted on the campus in a dormitory. It was a 1913 graduate of Morgan named Harry A. Wolford, who was employed as a teacher and dormitory matron at the school in Lynchburg that managed to save all of the students who were caught in the fire. Morgan College recognizes her heroism by naming this college infirmary in her honor. Thus, the Harry A. Warford University Health Center. Helen Roberts and Harriet Warford were both instrumental in the comfort and care of students. Can you imagine what would have happened to students if these women had never stepped foot on our campus? Now, each day as you journey across campus, the majority of you must utilize the bridge not the nice, beautiful bridge you have across uh, Perrin Parkway, but the bridge that spans over Cold Spring Lane. For decades, the bridge has played a major role in student life at Morgan. Instead of going to class, students would hang out on the bridge. If you wanted to find a significant other, you went and hung out on the bridge. If you wanted to meet up with your friends and catch the party bus, you met up on the bridge. If there was an event that you wanted everybody to know about, you hung your flyers on the bridge. If you want a good view of the Omegas stepping at homecoming, go stand on the bridge. Alumni, if you want to see your old classmates on homecoming day, where do you go? You go to the bridge. Now, when I arrived at Morgan in 2002, I, like hundreds of other students, thought that the name Welcome Bridge meant Welcome to Morgan. Today I want to set the record straight and tell you the story of Verda Freeman Welcome, who was born in Lake Lore, North Carolina in 1907. Her parents modeled for Verda a sensible work ethic and taught her to treat everyone fairly. Verda's mother stated, and I quote, my mother taught me how to carry myself as a woman. She taught me that my sex and my color were not barriers, regardless of what others may tell me. At the age of 19, Wilcom studied to become a teacher, securing employment with the segregated Baltimore City School System. During her teaching career, she observed the impact injustice, discrimination, and inequality had on African-American children in particular, and the larger African-American community in general. In 1939, Verda completed a Bachelor of Science degree from Morgan State College and a Master's degree from New York University in 1943. Her political career started in 1946 when she was elected president of the Northwest Improvement Association in Baltimore. Now, Verda knew that politics was pretty much local, but she realized that becoming an elected official would give her greater capacity to allocate resources beyond her local district. In 1958, welcome campaign for Baltimore's fourth district state delegate seat in Maryland. After winning the election, she vowed to represent all the people in her district and alleviate racial and class divisions. Her record promoted gun and smoking laws, public accommodations for the blind, legalizing interracial marriages, and ending welfare recipient harassment. In 1962, she campaigned for the Maryland State Senate. This proved a difficult challenge for Welcome because of the adverse response to her race and her gender. However, she was a Morganite. She was not discouraged. She fought hard and won, making history as the first African-American woman in the nation to hold a state Senate seat. She remained in office for 20 years. 
During her time in the state Senate, Welcome advocated for, the, um, for her alma mater by sponsoring legislation which elevated Morgan to university status in 1975 and securing state funding to erect a footbridge, the bridge, over Cold Spring Lane to connect the north and south sides of campus in 1964. For that reason, the infamous and most revered landmark on campus was named in her honor, the Verda Elf Welcome Bridge. Again, I ask, what would Morgan do without the impact of women? What would we do without a Miss Morgan State University? No more coronations, pageants, and graceful walks around the football stadium on homecoming day. Now, did you know that in 1963, Morgan students protested the racial segregation of Northwood Shopping Center? Among the protesters front and center was Miss Morgan College 1963, who on February 15th of that year, with 25 other students, entered the lobby of what was then a theater over in Northwood to purchase tickets to see a movie. They were denied admission. But when they were denied, the students refused to leave. So the police came in, escorted them out to a paddy wagon, and they were jailed overnight for trespassing. Demonstrations at that theater by hundreds of Morgan students would continue for six consecutive days prompting, but more like forcing the mayor of Baltimore to integrate the Northwood Theater. The last story I want to share is about a group of women who have been impacting Morgan for the last 83 years. This organization is known as the Morgan State University Women, founded in 1934 and it still exists today. To tell their story, I have to place the narrative in historical context. You see, in 1933, the city of Baltimore was severely affected by the Great Depression. Though Baltimore was home of the fourth busiest port in the country, many large industries and manufacturers of goods had to lay off numerous employees while others shut down completely. Since they accounted for the greatest percentage of blacks in any American city, African Americans in Baltimore suffered disproportionately from the depression with a rate of almost 50% unemployment. As Baltimore suffered financially from the depression, so did Morgan and its students. For the 1934, and I want you to listen students, for the 1933-34 academic year, tuition at Morgan cost $100. Wow. If a student lived on campus, room and board increased the amount to a total of $389 for the year. Wow. That's how much some of you pay for a book. While students at Morgan were able to work on campus, unemployment opportunities were scarce. Those who were able to secure on-campus employment worked as waiters in the dining room or in the campus laundry. There was also a student who was hired to ring the bell at the beginning and at the end of each class. Scholarships from individuals, organizations, and the college board of directors were also available to help ease the financial burden of students. However, the depression covered the campus of Morgan College like a thick black smoke, resulting in a myriad of problems. One of the first and major problems that the college faced was a drastic reduction in student enrollment. During the 1931-32 academic year, Morgan had an enrollment of 532 students. The next year, the enrollment was at 453, and by 1935, enrollment had dropped to 409 students. The impact of the economic depression not only negatively affected enrollment, but funds from the endowment investment also plummeted. High employment, unemployment rates meant that fewer students could pay student fees and contributions from churches dwindled. To make matters worse, the bank in which the college funds were deposited closed and never reopened. In an effort to improve the depressed economic condition of the institution, the trustees of Morgan College voted in a special meeting to impose a 60% cut in salaries for the faculty and staff. 
The salary reduction was enforced for 18 months, saving Morgan from a huge financial disaster and possibly closure. Now, recognizing the tremendous needs that the students and faculty at Morgan faced in June of, 13, in June of 1934, Bertha Proctor, Anna McMakin, and 100 religious and civic-minded women formed the Morgan College Ladies Auxiliary. The group consisted of wives of trustees, faculty women, wives of faculty, and community friends. Within the first year, the Ladies Auxiliary had accomplished several projects. They repaired and painted Wolford Hall, the freshman girls' dormitory. They also, they also supplied furniture, rugs, draperies, and 42 window shades for the common areas of the building. Their beautification projects included the planting of 200 tulips in front of Young Hall, another dormitory, and evergreens at the Hillen Road entrance. They raised $300 from a popularity contest to purchase six pairs of skates, ice skates for the students in the physical education department. Additionally, the ladies were able to secure the services of a black-owned taxi cab company to transport guests to the campus for special events at a very minimal cost. And they obtained free publicity, publicity for all of the organization's events in the Afro-American new, newspaper. One of the more important ro roles of the auxiliary was to serve as hostesses to African-Americans who visited Morgan College or served on the faculty. The ladies allowed visitors to reside in their homes during their stay in Baltimore because blacks were not allowed to secure lodging in the segregated area hotels. And visitors could not afford to pay due to the downturn in the economy. Now during the earlier years of Morgan College, there was a beautiful duck pond located on the North Campus. During the winter months, people from the nearby neighborhoods would go there to ice skate. The students at Morgan could not afford ice skates or the proper attire to, to participate. As a result, the ladies auxiliary purchased ice skates and the necessary items for the students. Soon they began to go ice skating on the pond. The white residents who lived across the street stopped coming, probably due to not wanting to mix with the black students. In the history of Morgan College, a century of purpose and action, 1867-1967, Edward Wilson speculated that if it had not been for the ladies' auxiliary, Morgan College probably would not have been reaccredited in 1935 by the Middle States Association of Colleges. In an effort to assist the college in its reaccreditation efforts, the ladies' auxiliary launched a well-organized campaign to obtain books for the library. Consequently, several thousand books were acquired and memorial scroll were placed in each book in this honor. When Morgan College became a state of Maryland College in 1939, the ladies' auxiliary was phased out. Many of the services that the auxiliary had provided for the college were now being funded by the state. However, the women continued to support the college through the annual cash award for Christian Witness, sponsored by the then Morgan Christian Center. As noted in the Morgan State University Women's February 1983 newsletter edition, it quoted that the membership began with a small group of women who were very much like a family and who had extended its hospitality to newcomers whose tastes and interests were harmonious with the ideals of the college. Again, I ask, where would Morgan be without the impact of women? from scholarly professors in the classroom, politicians in the state senate, Grammy-nominated artists to talented Olympic track athletes, Morgan State University has produced, groomed, and cultivated women who are erudite, classy, accomplished, and acclaimed throughout the world. The legacy of female thought leaders, civic activists, and staunch student advocates began in 1878 when Susie Carr Love became the first woman to graduate from Centenary Biblical Institute. Again, she was described as headstrong and determined, which are also characteristics of famed poet and author, Zora Neale Hurston, who graduated in 1918 from Morgan Academy, the high school arm of the university. 
While the state of Maryland was busy enforcing the notion of separate but equal, Morgan shaped a number of black female scholars who rank amongst the most respected educators of their time. Again, these women included Ida Cummings, class of 22, Irma Roy, class of 32, who was the first African-American principal of Western High School, which is the oldest all-girls public high school in the nation, and Dr. Ruth T. Sheffy, class of 47, one of the nation's foremost authorities on African-American literature who served on the Morgan faculty for 62 years. On the front lines for the fight for justice and equality was Verda Welcome, class of 35, the first black woman in the United States to be elected as a state in a state Senate seat. Victorine Q. Adams, class of 1940, the first black woman elected to the Baltimore City Council. Carrying the political torch forward is Catherine Pugh, class 1973, elected mayor of Baltimore in 2016. In the national spotlight are Rochelle Stevens, class of 88, two-time Olympic medal winner. Grammy-nominated artist Mesa Lee, class of 1991, and most recently seen on all the news media is senior White House correspondent April Ryan, class of 1989, who continues to challenge and hold President Trump accountable for his actions. I hope you learned something today new about Morgan. I hope it inspired you to create your own story and how you will make a difference during your time here. More importantly, I hope you recognize the impact women have had on this great campus and their indelible imprint on the 150 year legacy of Morgan State University. Thank you. What a rich legacy we hold as Morganites. Please, let's give a warm uh, hand clap for Dr. Corbett once again, please. Thank you so much, Dr. Corbett. Next, we will have a musical selection by Ms. Simone Speed. After that, we will have a presentation of award by Dr. Gloria Gibson, the Provost and Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs, assisted by Dr. Patricia Welsh, the Dean of the School of Education and Urban Studies. I am Tanya McClure-Dennis, Miss Morgan 1991-92, and it has been my pleasure to serve you on this morning. Following the awards, we will have our benediction by our pastor, Kimberly Richardson. Thank you again for coming. the strong get more while the weak ones fade empty pockets don't ever make the grave no 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 your mama may have and your papa may have but god bless the child
We are truly blessed at Morgan to have wonderful musical performances. Let's give them a hand. Uh, I'm very pleased to join you this morning uh, at Morgan's celebration of Women's History Month and specifically for its celebration of the contributions of Morgan women to this institution. And let me just add uh, and um, reiterate the statement of our speaker that Morgan would not be Morgan if it weren't for the contributions of women. <laughs> Dr. Corbett, Thank you so much for your very informative and inspiring keynote address this morning. You truly represent your alma mater well, and you have been one of our most invaluable resources as we have prepared for our sesquicentennial celebration, especially with your book on Outstanding Morgan Women. I asked Dr. Patricia D. Welch, Dean of the School of Education and Urban Studies to join me at the podium for this presentation. Dean Welch is the longest serving female academic dean in the history of Morgan and is also the senior dean leading an academic division. And I must say, the two years that I have been at Morgan, I have enjoyed working with you. And thank you for your service to Morgan State. We appreciate it. On behalf of uh, Dr. David Wilson, our president, who could not be here this morning, and the entire Morgan State University community, I am pleased to present the presidential citation in gratitude for your being our second sesquicentennial speaker for this celebration. And someone has the citation? The citation reads, Presidential Citation Sesquicentennial Lecture Award presented to Dr. Tanya G. Corbett Classes of 2005 and 14, author and dean of students at North Carolina Central University. I, David Wilson, president of Morgan State University, applaud and thank you, Dr. Tanya Corbett, for your distinguished service as former coordinator of student activities at Morgan, during which time you established the highly successful Leading Ladies Leadership Development and Personal Growth Series and were named one of Maryland's top 50 women under 40 by Maryland's Daily Record. I congratulate you for your achievements 
as Dean of Students at North Carolina Central University. I commend you for being a champion of African American history and culture through your extraordinary research on African American women at Morgan and in Baltimore. And I congratulate you on being the second lecturer in the lecture series of Morgan's sesquicentennial celebration, Sesquicentennial Women's History Month Convocation, March 9th, 2017, David Wilson, President. If you can please join me and let's stand as we prepare to exit this great celebration. <laughs> Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for the inspiring words imparted unto us on today by Dr. Toya Corbett. We thank you for the seeds of hope, courage, compassion, faith, love, and determination that have been planted in our lives. God, as we ask you to stir up the gifts and the creativity that lies within us, we look forward to what you're going to do in our lives and through our lives. We declare, as young Ruby Bridges caused us to dream, as Coretta Stock King sacrificed and supported her husband as she shared his dream with the world, and as Dorothy Vaughn, Mary Jackson, Katherine Johnson, and Christina Darton, the hidden figures of some of NASA's greatest success, held on to their dream, we are obligated to dream and to teach the next generation of our young girls the importance of dreaming and to remind them that dreams do come true. For I am a witness of that as I proudly stand before you as a graduate of Morgan State University, the great MSU. Now let the words of our mouths and the meditation of our heart be acceptable in your sight. For Father, you truly are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Have a wonderful evening. <laughs>